Oh. So uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank my predecessor, Ruan, who I think is on this call, who um, who I used some of his old slides uh, to help develop this talk. Um, and I know he used some of Nicole's, so this has kind of been passed along um, and updated over the years. <clears throat> so this talks on cervical spinal alignment and deformity. Um, for the outlines of the talk, we're going to first talk about anatomy and biomechanics, then get into specific alignment parameters, and then the relation of these uh, parameters to uh, the other spinal segments in the thoracic and lumbar spine, and then move on to the etiology of uh, cervical spinal deformity, the relationship to um, health-related quality of life outcomes, and then uh, considerations for surgical intervention. So for some basic anatomy, the C-spine uh, localizes the head over the body and the pelvis, um, as well as uh, helps the pati uh, uh, patients and people maintain horizontal gaze. Uh, the center of mass of the um, head over overlies the occipital condyles, and it's one centimeter cranial and anterior to the external auditory canal. Um, the load distribution, interestingly, in the cervical spine is, is about 64% or two-thirds in the posterior columns um, and only one-third in the anterior column. This is in direct contrast to the lumbar spine, um, which is about, which is just the opposite, about two-thirds in the uh, anterior column and uh, one third in the posterior column. And this has a uh, 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 biomechanical um, significance later when we talk about uh, approaches to the spine and the posterior uh, ligamentous complex. Uh, there's an important role for the cervical spine in influencing global spinal alignment. Uh, pelvic and thoracolumbar compensatory changes uh, may occur with cervical spinal deformity in order to uh, allow the patient to maintain horizontal gaze uh, and allow them to function throughout their daily life. So the main alignment parameters we're gonna talk about are cervical lordosis, uh, translation in the sagittal plane, uh, horizontal gaze parameters, and um, other novel parameters that have been gaining increasing recognition over the last couple of years. So uh, just some uh, basic measurements for cervical lordosis. Uh, the most common is the C2, C7 Cobb angle. Um, this is what you know we all know uh, very well. Uh, it's the most popular. There's good inner and intra-rater reliability for this method. Um, and it's the one that I've seen used most often. Now there's also a Jackson method, which is basically uh, also C2 and C7, but you're measuring parallel lines to the posterior surface of C2 and C7. Um, and uh, it's, it's certainly used less commonly. Uh, the Harrison method is perhaps the most accurate in terms of determining overall cervical lordosis. Um, however, it's complex. You have to draw parallel lines to the posterior surfaces of every single vertebrae, and then you have to sub sum the segmental angles. So it's really not used in, in practice um, a lot. Um, uh, this is a study from 1997, one of the classic studies that showed, uh, basically looked at normal patients, 100 volunteers with, uh, without any uh, cervical problems, no neck or arm problems. Um, and they found uh, that for these patients, the um, cervical lordosis, average cervical lordosis is about 40 degrees. And most of this was centered at C1 and C2. So when we're doing the C2 to C7 um, measurements for cervical lordosis, we just have to recognize that we're leaving out an important component of cervical lordosis um, at C, C1, C2. And that should be uh, taken into account either separately or together uh, with the uh, other measurements. Uh, the next uh, commonly used parameter is the sagittal vertical axis. This can be either measured in combination with the thoracolumbar spine uh, or um, in isolation. So um, this is essentially the measurement of the translation of the cervical spine in the sagittal plane. Um, most commonly when we're talking about cervical deformity, we're talking about uh, for, you know, a positive sagittal vertical axis, meaning that the head is forward uh, in comparison in comparison to the body, um, but in, in theory, it can be the other way as well. Both C2 and C7 sagittal vertical axis have been used uh, to, divine, to define global sagittal alignment, um, basically measuring the um, translational distance between those vertebrae and the posterior superior corner of the sacrum allows you to measure those um, distances. Uh, if you use the C2 global sagittal vertical axis, 
um, then you are essentially uh, looking at the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine in combination, uh, whereas the C7 uh, SVA, which goes to the posterior aspect of, I'm sorry, the C2 SVA, which goes from the uh, C2 um, uh, body to the posterior inferior aspect of C7, um, allows you to look just at um, the cervical spine. Um, that's the regional measurement of uh, cervical, um, uh, sagittal vertical axis. The normal range for C2 to C7 SVA uh, is around 16.8 millimeters. Um, a, a new, newer um, measurement, um, and, and this is largely clinical, is the chin brow uh, vertebral axis. Essentially, this is a measurement of horizontal gaze. Um, it's especially useful when evaluating severe rigid cervical kyphotic deformities um, and, and kind of giving an objective measure as to the patient's ability to maintain um, a horizontal gaze. Uh, it's the angle between a line drawn from the patient's chin to their brow and a line vertical to gravity. Um, there's multiple studies that have shown this, that deformity correction that considers this angle is associated with better post-operative outcomes in, in terms of improved gaze, ambulation, and ADLs. Uh, in uh, 2016, uh, this study in neurosurgery looked at 303 patients um, and who went, underwent full body x-rays and basically found that um, for patients that had CBVA of, um, of uh, greater than 17.7 degrees, um, they had very high uh, Os Oswestry Disability Index scores. Um, and so this is kind of showing, again, that this is a clinically relevant measurement. Um, the, there's a, these, these measurements as well that you can look at, uh, thoracic in, inlet angle, the neck tilt, and the T1 slope. Um, the cervical spine is a really mobile segment, so a really wide range of normal alignment has been described. But um, these, are kind of, these measurements are essentially taking what we know about the uh, lumbosacral uh, uh, parameters over the last number of years and kind of translating it to the um, cervical spine. So this was first described by Lee et al. in 2012. They analyzed multiple uh, parameters in 77 asymptomatic volunteers. They looked at neck tilt, which um, the, the, these three measurements kind of correlate to the pelvic parameters of pelvic incidence, pelvic tilt, and sacral slope. So if you look at the um, uh, cartoon on the right, you can see that the um, the neck tilt is essentially the same as pelvic tilt. Um, and so what you're seeing is you're seeing a, a line from the vertical to the manubrium and then to the T1 body. So, and and that's kind of co the corollary of the pelvic tilt and the pelvis. The, the T1 slope is the corollary of the sacral slope in the pelvis and the TIA um, or the um, thoracic inlet angle is basically the correlate of the pelvic incidence in the pelvis. So the same uh, ge geometric uh, calculations apply. Um, so just as in the pelvis, uh, pelvic incidence is equal to the pelvic tilt plus the sacral slope in the cervical spine, the TIA is equal to the um, neck tilt uh, plus the T1 slope. So the reason this is important is because just like the sacral slope or the pelvic uh, incidence is related to the lumbar lordosis in terms of maintaining uh, a compensatory uh, alignment in the lumbar spine, in the neck, the T1 slope and the uh, cervical lordosis are, uh, are intricately uh, intertwined. So the body is trying to essentially keep the neck tilt at around 44 degrees, which minimizes the energy expenditure of the neck muscles. And so when there is a large um, T1 slope, then the neck has to have a large lordosis in order to maintain the neck tilt at that level. And when patients are no longer able to do that, they start to decompensate. Um, this is a uh, study looking at the use of this angle. Uh, in practice, they did a retrospective review of 52 53 patients uh, using the S2-SVA uh, to allow global, global alignment. Uh, 
um, and they looked at uh, multiple radiographic parameters, which included the T1 slope, as well as a number of other ones. They found that the T1 slope was the most predictive um, in the most predictive in, ter in terms of determining C2 SVA uh, of any of the uh, parameters they measured. When patients had uh, a greater T1 tilt than 25 degrees, their sagittal vertical axis was uh, in general about 10 centimeters positive. Um, so patients with less than 13 degrees of T1 um, slope had uh, most often had a negative uh, SVA. So um, the cervical spine, it's important to consider it in isolation, but it's also important to consider it as a part of the unit and it's, a, it's integrally related to the thoracic and the lumbar spine as well. So um, there was a study a, a little while back by Ames et al. that looked at um, retrospective radiographic analyses of 55 asymptomatic volunteers and they basically found what we kind of all know at this point, which is that pelvic incidence correlates with lumbar lordosis, which then correlates with thoracic kyphosis, which then correlates with cervical lordosis. So any, the bottom line is that any abnormality along that chain can affect the, uh, the alignment further down the chain. So um, lumbar problems can, can essentially create um, cervical problems down the line and vice versa. Um, cervical hyperlilosis uh, may be compensatory in nature as well. Um, this is a, a study uh, by Newman in 2019. Dr. Mundus was also involved in which 171 patients undergoing deformity surgery for thoracolumbar uh, deformity were then measured in terms of their C2 to 7 lordosis uh, at six weeks and at two years. And the authors found that um, once the thoracolumbar deformity had been corrected, uh, the patients tended to uh, lose uh, their C C2 to 7 lordosis, uh, their compensatory lordosis, uh, most at six weeks, and then it kind of evened out by about two years. So this is an example uh, on the right. You can see that this patient with a bad thoracolumbar deformity has a compensatory C2 to C7 lordosis of 15 degrees in order to try to maintain horizontal gaze. So they're hyperlordosing their neck. And when they have an appropriate correction of their thoracolumbar spine, their C2 to 7 lordosis drops to 9 degrees, and they're able to maintain a horizontal gaze with less strain on their neck muscles. <clears throat> so this is a review of 470 um, adult patients with thoracolumbar deformity in the ISSG database. Um, and this basically, the authors looked at patients who had ASD, um, but but were not undergoing surgery. And they look, looked at these patients um, over time and determined how many, uh, how many patients also had cervical problems. And there was a 31% incidence of cervical kyphosis uh, independently in those patients, as well as a 29% incidence of positive uh, sagittal vertical axis in the cervical spine. So the overall precedence of some kind of cervical deformity, um, either one of those, um, in, in patients with thoracolumbar deformity was 50, 53%. Um, so what that's telling us is that, that in, in every patient with thoracolumbar deformity is being worked up for potential surgery, we should also be considering uh, the cervical spine, both in terms of how it's affecting the patient, but also in terms of how it's going to react to the surgery. Uh, this is a 2018 ISSG study. Uh, that, look, that looked at 143 non-operative thoracolumbar patients with one and two year follow-up. And uh, they again found that the baseline incidence uh, for cervical deformity was around 40%. But after surgery at one year, there was a new onset incidence um, in patients that didn't have it of 30%. And by two years, that was 42% for cervical deformity uh, following thoracolumbar deformity correction. Or I'm sorry, following um, just in patients who were non-operative. So the risk factors for new cervical deformity include baseline uh, high SVA, C2 slope, as well as patients who had, had prior spine surgery. So uh, the um, cervical lordosis can be thought of, of thought of as an adaptive spinal parameter. Um, 
in that patients are really using it to help maintain their horizontal gaze despite what's happening in their thoracolumbar spine and their pelvis. The major parameters that are used to assess the alignment um, we've discussed before, uh, the TIA and the neck tilt affects uh, the alignment of the cervical spine and are really kind of forming the foundations for future research um, in this area as their um, correlates to the uh, pelvic parameters that have proved so important over the last uh, decade. Uh, T1 slope in particular is an important factor in, in determining the degree of cervical lordosis, um, just as pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis are uh, so intricately tied. Um, this is alterable through uh, compensation uh, below, so that's important to note that's an important difference. Um, in terms of etiologies for cervical deformity, uh, you, that you can kind of bunch them into two groups, primary and secondary deformities. Uh, um, in terms of primary deformities, those are generally congenital uh, problems. Uh, importantly, uh, left untreated primary congenital defects in the thoracolumbar spine can result in secondary deformities in the cervical spine and vice versa. Uh, traumatic deformity is also possible inflammatory issues uh, such as um, ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis, iatrogenic, uh, meaning uh, things like um, post-laminectomy syndrome uh, and degenerative conditions. So in terms of just degenerative changes, cervical spondylosis, uh, there's a kind of well-described um, sequence of events where the disc starts to defecate. It bulges on the annulus and increases the pressure. The, the, because of that increased pressure, there's de decreased uh, nutrition that the disc is able to get, it loses height uh, and increases the weight bearing on the anterior column instead of the posterior two columns of the cervical spine. And this starts a kind of a vicious cycle of increased degeneration. In terms of iatrogenic causes, that it still is the most common cause of cervical kyphotic deformity. Um, it's usually after a previous laminoplasty or laminectomy. The incidence is uh, difficult to measure, but it's thought to be likely secondary to denervation of the posterior cervical muscles, as well as uh, loss of the tension band, which is inherent to posterior uh, surgical surgery, disruption of the facet joints, and increasing compressive forces and shifting of the weight-bearing axis anteriorly. Um, <clears throat> It's, uh, it's thought to be, uh, patients are thought to be at increased risk of this if they have a baseline increased T1 slope as well. So in terms of classifications for cervical deformity, um, there's been increased interest in trying to develop, develop a reproducible way of classifying these deformities. Um, this is a um, ISSG uh, classification scheme that was developed um, in 2015 um, through a Delphi protocol. Um, and as you can see, there's um, cervical deformity class. It's, 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 um, there's basic classifications uh, for the descriptor of the deformity. And then there's five different modifiers based on the SVA, the horizontal gaze, the um, T1 slope minus cervical or, or lordosis minus T1 slope, the patient's um, neurologic compromise in terms of myelopathy, and then their Schwab classification for their uh, thoracolumbar deformity. In terms of the deformity descriptors, um, these, are, these are some examples. Uh, a type C or the, it lab labeled A in the box is a primary sagittal deformity, which has uh, an apex in the cervical spine. Uh, the next is an apex in the cervical thoracic junction, which is seen in B here. Then there's an apex in the thoracic spine, which can be seen in the box labeled C. Uh, Primary coronal deformities are, are deemed S, and the, that can be seen in the box labeled D. And then issues with the, the last one is um, C, CVJ, which is basically a craniovertebral junction deformity. Um, and you can see an example of that in box E. So why does this matter? Well, it matters to patients' quality of life and their health related quality of life outcomes. In Thoracolumbar deformity, as we've discussed before, the evidence suggests that pelvic incidence is a rough guide to estimate the amount of lumbar lordosis, which needs to be restored based on uh, pelvic anatomy. Um, and there's kind of an increasing thought that uh, T1 slope and cervical lordosis um, should be considered in a similar manner. 
it's a little more complex because the T1 slope is, is variable. Um, and so the, you know, a formula to kind of come up with an ideal cervical or dosis is, has yet to be identified. Um, in general, um, the thought process is to try to match patient's T1 slope to their cervical or dosis um, in the, in, assuming that you've um, looked at the rest of the spine as well and taken that into account. So uh, in two, that, these, these, this is just some evidence that uh, alignment affects health related quality of life measures. Uh, there's a study in 2015, um, which basically showed that increased uh, sagittal vertical axis resulted in worse uh, health related quality of life scores um, and that changes in cervical um, lordosis correlated with improvements in those patients. Uh, in 2016, uh, IR et al. looked at 90 patients with a variety of uh, cervical conditions and found that higher SVA and um, lower uh, cervical lordosis were predictors of high preoperative neck disability index. And finally, Lee in 2014 looked at um, 102 adult scoliosis patients and 50 controls uh, with multiple measurements um, and basically found that uh, poor sagittal alignment in the cervical spine um, I was associated with worse outcomes. Uh, C2 to 7 SVA uh, was seen as a significant predictor of VAS, NDI, and neck pain, uh, and disability scores. Um, this is a study, again, an ISSG study in, of 113 patients who underwent multi-level posterior fusion uh, for stenosis, myelopathy, and kyphosis. They looked at multiple regional cervical um, radiograph me radiographic measurements and immediate follow-up, um, and both C2 to 7 SVA as well as the gravity line SVA were negatively correlated with SF36 scores. Um, the C2 to 7 SVA was positively correlated with uh, and neck disability index scores uh, as well as uh, compensatory C1 to lordosis. Uh, the regression models predicted a threshold of 40 millimeters beyond which correlations between um, sagittal vertical axis and neck disability were the most significant. <clears throat> this is just another study looking at outcomes uh, with cervical alignment, basically showing that, um, that patients who um, were able to maintain or improve their segmental sagittal alignment uh, after um, after cervical surgery had a statistically higher improvement in SF36 and NDI scores. So in terms of what surgery to do, um, first we have to think about uh, how to prevent um, cervical deformity and then how to treat it uh, when it does happen. So in terms of prevention, um, you know, all spine surgery is deformity surgery, surgery to a certain extent, and we have to be careful that we're not uh, putting patients at risk of it with a surgery that we do for um, neurologic compromise. So when treating cervical myelopathy and radiculopathy, surgeons should consider the possible future development of iatrogenic cervical kyphotic deformity uh, as post-laminectomy kyphosis is still the most common cause of isolated cervical spine deformity. In terms of posterior only approaches for the treatment of cervical myelopathy, uh, in patients with a pre-op uh, loss of kyphosis, which it should be recognized that they're at the highest risk of iatrogenic drop head and post-laminectomy plus laminectomy kyphosis, especially when they have high T1 slopes. Surgeons in these cases should consider anterior combined approaches uh, versus extending the fusion distally into the thoracic spine. This is an algorithm that, um, that uh, came out in 2014 out of uh, Jefferson, uh, trying to come up with a, uh, an objective strategy for how to correct patients with cervical deformity. Uh, and the first step is essentially to determine whether this is a flexed deformity or a uh, flexible deformity or fixed deformity or flexible deformity. So patients who are flexibly and passively correctable, there's a lot more options in terms of where to approach first uh, and how to do it. So uh, you can do anterior posterior combined um, with flexible uh, in any order. Um, the kind of complex patients are the ones who are fixed and not uh, passively correctable. So patients who uh, are ankylosed often need an osteotomy. Uh, and if they are unable to, if, if they're unable to raise their head even 
enough um, when uh, under anesthesia uh, to access the anterior spine, it might, it's possible that the surgeon has to do a um, release in the back, uh, fusion in the front, and then fusion in the back. Um, but this, the, these are, this is kind of still a work in progress in terms of kind of coming up with algorithms for this, um, but it continues to be complex. Um, in terms of different types of releases and osteotomies in order to def determine deformity correction, uh, the Schwab classification has gained uh, popularity. Um, these are the uh, seven grades of Schwab osteotomies for the cervical spine. Uh, the first is a uh, partial facet uh, resection, which is either from the front or the back. From the front, it's basically just an ACDF with a little bit of aggressive um, uncovertebra resection. And from the, the posterior aspect, if it's um, like a grade one uh, thoracolumbar osteotomy with a uh, remo partial removal of the joint. Grade twos uh, are resection of both superior and inferior facets uh, from the back. Uh, the lamina, ligamentum flavum, and spinous processes can also be removed. And this is uh, able to correct a little bit more of the kyphosis. Um, and you're able to correct kyphosis from the back. This is an example of some significant uh, correction of cervical kyphosis, uh, all from the posterior approach. Grade three includes uh, partial or complete corpectomies. Um, and this uh, uh, includes the adjacent discs. Uh, it requires mobility in the posterior elements in order to allow for that correction. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of a patient with a chin on chest deformity who uh, had significant um, correction uh, of, their lord, of their cervical lordosis with a corpectomy in the front as well as uh, uh, stabilizing fusion in the back. Grade four is a complete uncovertebral resection. And uh, this is basically a resection all the way out into the uh, transverse foramina um, and uh, in severe kyphosis, uh, this, the vertebral artery can be skeletonized in order to avoid kinking with the correction. Um, here's, here's an example below. Grade five is an opening wedge osteotomy. This is essentially a fracture, uh, an osteoclastic fracture through the uh, anterior column from the posterior um, neck. And uh, this is generally in patients with severely ankylosed cervical spines. Uh, for example, patients with ankylosing spondylitis as seen here. Grade six is a pedicle subtraction osteotomy in the cervical spine. It's generally in, if this is a closing wedge osteotomy as opposed to the previous type, um, this is usually done in the cervical thoracic junction in order to um, stay out of the uh, entrance of the vertebral arteries into the transverse foramen. And uh, grade, this should say grade seven, that's a complete uh, vertebral column resection. It's pretty rarely used in the cervical spine outside of uh, tumor settings, but this allows for a pretty much complete correction. So in conclusion, cervical malignment, uh, malalignment and deformity have a myriad of etiologies, primary, secondary, compensatory that can be debilitating. Uh, there's a number of different ways to measure alignment and um, our ability to be nuanced in terms of our uh, global and focal alignment measures have been uh, increasing over the years. Uh, most of these do have an effect on health-related quality of life uh, measures and are important to evaluate preoperatively. Uh, cerv cervical sagittal malignment, mal a cervical sagittal alignment is directly related to the thoracolumbar spinal pelvic alignment and the T1 slope um, and should be considered as a unit. Successful deformity correction has to focus not only on restoring proper cervical lordosis, but also on um, maintaining global balance and considering the cervical deformity in the light of the entire patient. The factors in cervical alignment that best predict outcomes remain completely understood and are continuing to be studied. So this is certainly an area of active research uh, and interest. So that's all I have here. Um, anyone has uh, some comments, questions, I'm happy to open up the floor.
great review, Dan. Uh, thanks for walking us through that. I know it's a, uh, it gets crazy complex and it seems like it's still a uh, pretty complex, co- pretty complicated relative to the focal lumbar spine where we found a way to help simplify things. Um, but I think it's more complicated because the, you know, there is no true pelvis up in the uh, cervical spine like there is in the in the lumbar spine. And so the chain of events that happens from the pelvis up to the neck is still very relevant. And so you have to always consider what's happening down low relative to what you're trying to achieve above, you know? Absolutely. And that's what's so challenging about the cervical spine, you know? I mean, the the measures, you know, the, the TIA and T1 slope really try to get at that, but it, it's just not to the same uh, level as what we know about the thoracolumbar spine. So, and you can see, like you know, whenever we write papers, and you know, we usually use some of our best cases to display in the articles, right? Mm-hmm. If you look at your grade six osteotomy, or I think it's grade six, that one right there. Yeah, that th- should one, be go, go one down, <laughs> and then the one, the next one. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you look at the SVA on that, on go on the, the next, the last one. This one. So again, the SVA on that one, yeah. I mean, yeah. Even with the PSO and multi-level fusion and probably releases in the back, your C27 SVA is still way forward. And so, yeah. You know, looking at these extras like this is probably myopic. You know, you need to really zoom out to, to understand what's happening below. And I don't think we understand how the thoracic and lumbar spine are going to compensate even to a you know big cervical realignment. Yeah, just interesting. That's a good point. Any other comments? You leave us speechless, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um...